Welcome everyone to our June seminar in the COE race. Today we have a very special topic called High Performance Data Analytics. We see Helmholtz Analytics Toolkit. In short, heat. It is actually fitting to the temperatures we have here and there in Europe. So um, in this, a very timely topic. And I just want to say welcome, introduce the speakers before I introduce a little bit the idea why heat might be relevant for race. But uh, just let me finish here. I think one entry that is very important because here is one of the speakers missing and I should correct this right away. Um, this was a lady which was called Charlotte Debut. Debut, I hope I spell that correctly. She will join us later um, in the call. So that was missing. So we have actually two speakers today, um, which I invited from different institutions. So when I will start a little bit with COE race, more general aspects, building on what we had the last time on the data intensive aspects. So the last time we had Git based data management with data lab, and then we talked a lot about data. I will reuse these materials and put it in through the light what we will do with this data and thinking about AI modeling where also then this heat framework can make sense. But of course I keep it very, let's say more as an overview where those really would make sense to apply those techniques. And then the real introduction to um, heat will be given by Claudia Comito and Charlotte Debu. And also here we have a typo I see introduction to heat of course, so. Sorry for this. And I think we have their uh, technical introduction and also uh, more user perspective included. So you see it's one hour, 20 minutes. So it's quite interesting. This time we don't really do a break. Um, I think then, however, we'll have lots of time for questions and answers from your perspective. If you have already questions, please feel free to put them down in the chat. And then we basically can take them up later in the call. Because of the recordings, we prefer to just follow on essentially with the presentations and then have the Q&A session ready to solve all your problems and questions. Concerning the speakers, we have here um, Dr. Claudio Comito. She is really involved in, with HEAT a long time and has really lots of detailed insights about it and works at the Jülich Supercomputing Center in Germany. Then we have Dr. Charlotte Debu. I know Debu. I know really if that's the right spelling. Claudia, would uh, how is she called? <laughs> Debus, I guess she Debus. she's German. Ah, okay. I always ah, heard Debus. Okay. <laughs> okay, very good to know. Good. Um, and the last enforcer, they switched from Karlsruhe to Dila. Is that correct? Right, she is, she is now a DLR researcher. Uh, oh, I'm so. sorry, no, she used to be a DLR and now she's ah. at KIT. Okay, okay, yeah, so I think mm -hmm. that we also um, have to change something. So now KIT, I thought it's the other way around, but according to what is was given on ResearchGate and um, yeah. on the internet as the other way around of doing a PhD at KIT, I think, and then DLR or something. Oh uh, yeah, anyway, that's probably so... the, the previous step. <laughs> Uh, okay, but now she is in kit again, yeah. right? Okay, excellent. Yeah, we maybe correct this in the in the recording then for the audience, but it doesn't matter. The important thing is that she is talking about heat uh, more from a little bit as a consumer perspective, as I understand. Then uh, shortly to my um, person, I'm teaching high performance computing and parallel and scalable machine learning at the University of Iceland here but I'm also the UHPC Joint Undertaking Governing Board member of Iceland. That's why the seminar is also organized in the realm of the National Competence Center, uh, basically in the framework of the EuroCC projects. So let me just briefly introduce this EuroCC projects and the idea what we do with this under the umbrella of the UHPC Joint Undertaking. So the seminar is hosted by the so-called EHPC community that is funded by the EuroCC project in creating lots of different simulation and data labs, which essentially do here on the right-hand side, community support and research in terms of HPC and being also contact partners for the industry. So we have lots of labs that we constantly um, actually extend, but one of the highlights is definitely also remote sensing, one of our research endeavors, where you see University of Iceland is one of the six best countries in the world um, based on some rankings. So 
Um, this is so far for Iceland. Um, basically, we have a very strong collaboration also with the Ulysses Supercomputing Center, which we also see in COE Race, but what we also have seen in the deep projects and also follow through the basically modular supercomputing design we have seen uh, in Europe and hopefully have also then here in Jülich an excess scale machine in 2023, 2024. Of course, we are also involved from the Icelandic perspective is the Lumi system architecture and Lumi supercomputers. And actually there are also really much modular concepts like we have seen also in the modular supercomputing designed around deep and the systems we have in the Jülich supercomputing center. So, so much for the welcome. Um, basically now I would switch briefly to an introduction, what topics is of relevance and why we think heat could be a potential tool to help us here. So let's bring this a little bit into context of the COE RACE project. So um, I will of course repeat a little bit what CEO RACE is doing, but if you want to know all the details, you see our website that is actually constantly growing these days. So you see more and more content is actually available and the use cases and news. So I encourage you to go to our website and there basically then have also um, much more information that I can possibly share today. So the overall motivation approach is essentially to have a full loop to see about that we have simulations based on numerical laws and numerical methods and physical laws, and then working on data, create data. And then we want to reuse this created data from simulations, from scientific simulations back for AI. And this could be in different areas. Um, actually, we do surrogate modeling, we do other normal, let's say, AI in post-processing to also understand better parameter spaces. So I come to this in a moment, but long story short, we do a lot of AI modeling in this project as well. While in the first period of the project, we just starting to understand what simulation use cases we have and what data is existing to understand what modeling we can do. So that's why it's timely to think about now what frameworks like HEAT or TensorFlow, PyTorch, et cetera, all of those which are around, and I know Claudia has a very nice slide that brings that all on one perspective, which is probably 200 icons. And I'm looking forward to this to, to have the explanation and the big overview. But here you think about that COE race will, let's say, pick some of them to create something like a unique AI framework methodology. And we have to see then how that fits into the different use cases of COE race. Not all of them maybe have let's say the same requirements. That's why we also look into these use cases right now to understand the different requirements in terms of data sets generating, um, AI modeling, and all the different aspects that actually fell to the point of how we can scale up um, essentially these codes together with AI modeling. So this brings us to the field sometimes of distributed training of deep learning, distributed training of machine learning, so that really big data can be processed and so that our whole approach scales. So when you looked at the idea of these different use cases, we have nine in the COE race, um, reaching from traditional computational fluid dynamics that we see here for IE for turbulent boundary layers, up to really, let's say data generation use cases in sound engineering where the data is actually created in an anechoic chamber. So they all create lots of data. And this is where our AI modeling will start to understand what data can we use in order to basically help the insights in all of these different use cases. We have wind farm modeling. Um, we have different areas of 3D printing and understanding the errors in 3D printing and manufacturing. So you see quite a diverse set of use cases, which is not easy to, let's say, to just give them all a unique or common AI framework and then it will work right away. We know that AI modeling is much more deeper, much more complex. It actually connects more or less three or four things really. So firstly, you see here on the right-hand side, the hardware infrastructure is of course of relevance when you do AI modeling and big data processing. So you need something that really should scale up for exascale. That means we need a proper hardware that is given by the supercomputing centers, parallel, let's say file systems, for example. And then we have the whole software infrastructure, which of course is also a very important part. And you learned already about data lab the last seminar, 
But of course, there are many other frameworks around and tools and heat could be one of it, right? Of the software infrastructure of this unique AI um, framework methodology. And we have to find out where it is good in. And I know from some papers, they have really um, some interesting approaches and also beat the performance of some of the other tools in some certain areas. Of course, however, these let's two general aspects don't work alone. So that's why we adopt this so-called co-design of thinking about what of these computing driven use cases we have seen. And some of them were more data driven like the sound engineering one. So you see those are of course also tightly intertwined in the decision how basically such a, let's say unique AI framework methodology would look like. And of course, what we don't want is to reinvent the wheel. And I think one of Claudia's questions I will ask, and I think many others would ask, why another tool, right? We come to this question at the end, I guess, here of the seminar. Why was heat developed when there was already PyTorch or let's say TensorFlow there? But of course, they all have their different unique selling propositions and maybe also some limitations. And we will hear about this later on. By doing so, um, we will have something like a library that should build on open source community tools like basically AI and HPC best practices and also maybe put in the light what's happening in EuroHPC. As you know, we there's lots of changes now with Praise. EuroHPC um, is coming with a joint undertaking and having the next actually Digital Europe and Horizon Europe program with lots of new research to be done. And of course, now we have the setup of the EuroCC National Competence Centers in Europe, which means also we can maybe unite, um, let's say, the ideas of how such, you know, um, unique AI framework could be maintained and then hopefully also made sustainable over time. So the vision um, intertwined HPC simulations and with AI um, is a slide I have shown already in some other seminars, just to give you an example how that could look like. When you have here, for instance, a full loop of um, scientific simulations where you do uh, meteorological ensembles and you have maybe thousands of them, you let them all running in parallel, of course, in the supercomputer, but you quickly can find out with some, let's say, AI techniques and statistical tools that you basically some of these ensembles will not work. So you can actually cancel them earlier to save computational time. Or you learn basically over time here by some, let's say, um, tools to learn from the simulations in the past, how basically predictions in the future for the simulation parameter space will be. And you can basically from this learn better the parameter spaces of the simulations using maybe particle filters. So all of this is an example that actually this is really happening to intertwine those. Um, of course, the question still maintains how we can ensure that this is running on exascale machines, which are coming up, um, as I said earlier in 2023, 2024, probably in Jülich, for example. However, you see it's not so um, unusual to use these HPC systems also in AI modeling. Here you see a um, part that we did as one example here, where we let just say, basically did the distributed training of remote sensing models. And here we use, let's say the old V100s. Um, now you saw, you know that Juvels has already A100s and we do our baby steps with those as well. But here you see already with distributed training, like using Horovod, we will come to this also, I guess, doing Claudia's talk and in the questions, we can really scale up or basically make the speed up really happening also in the AI modeling, especially in the training part of it. Of course, the inference or the testing is usually not a really big problem. It's very quickly done. Once the model is trained, you can essentially scale per data item very quickly up. So the key challenge usually is to, to train these models in a distributed setup. And we will talk about this, I think, later on. Now, when we think about, again, these um, unique AI framework where we're talking about in race is something really you want to learn what the community is doing. That's why we have the seminar today on HEAT to understand um, what really we could maybe use, could we basically contribute somehow with our use cases to the HEAT development? Um, what is the situation with HEAT in the future in terms of community support and more use cases? And this is, um, I think, a very interesting, exciting time because COA Race is just at the start of a three years um, program of really working hard on AI intertwined with the simulation use cases. And this would include, from the AI modeling perspective, quite many aspects. So you see, we have to talk about deep learning, scaling with frameworks like Horobot DeepSpeed, 
how to what extent we can use heat in a similar manner. Um, we have to talk about different AI methods. So we have to see in the use case, sometimes they have sequence data, which means we need more sequence models. In other words, maybe recurrent neural network structures, things like gated recurrent units or long short term memories. On the other hand, we have also use cases where we do image recognition. So this means we have also other models maybe based more on convolution neural networks or transfer learning techniques really using or reusing a ResNet 50 or even a bigger one for basically then transferring from an um, idea of a very general use case like identifying let's say cows and trees and horses in a scene up to really pixel wise classification of remote sensing images for example. So these are all techniques we have to talk about in the realm of this AI framework and how we actually then basically support the AI modeling. Um, it goes without saying that the key aspects or the key challenge really in AI modeling is this searching for the right parameters. So here are different areas where we also believe we could make a contribution in neural architecture search, um, but also think about hyperparameter tuning in a more semi-automatic way, auto ML methods maybe that we're gonna see have also a role to play when we talk about this unique AI framework. A more, let's say, um, contributing part to the AI modeling in the data preparation part is really this data augmentation approaches. We will see that some CFD simulations are incredibly heavy in terms of computing time. So we cannot just run turbulent flow simulations again and again and again on exascale machine. Uh, we really run out of computational time. So for AI modeling, this is a challenge. We don't have enough, let's say, data from statistical learning theory to build the proper model. So we have to talk also there about surrogate models, maybe easier models to do an enrichment of data and other data augmentation approaches around. And that's what we do in the next years to come. And again, there we try in the moment in the project really to understand first the use cases. We did their so-called fact sheets will be also, of course, available to the community. And this process was basically already, let's say, finished. The first draft are basically existing. And now we refine those fact sheets with a so-called interaction room process, where we really have so-called mural boards, where all the use case partners come together and refine the fact sheets. And the idea is much more in detail what different areas we could embark on. A rough example is given here. You see fact sheets show a little bit which components in general are relevant, and you see immediately our AI modeling is again very much in the heart of it, again with technologies and tools, maybe like TensorFlow, DeepSpeed for the distributed training, or basically also traditional models, maybe like a typical parallel SVM. So these are things we kind of getting out of all these fact sheets, um, and we also publish with them. And by going through the different fact sheets, we basically iteratively see that there's a quite range of AI models to be created. So you see on the left-hand side, all the different use cases that we have in our project. And here the different, let's say, AI models we identified in the, let's say, initial part of this project before we actually submitted the project. So from auto encoders, transfer learning, up to physics informed deep learning, or basically sequence models with LSTMs. There's a broad range that an AI framework really has to support. And this is something, of course, we have to think about and are in the moment to figure out how that could look like. We apply for this a certain technique called um, actually interaction room. And if you missed the seminar, don't worry, we have it on YouTube. That's why everybody of you, you're also encouraged, of course, to go to our YouTube channel. Also the last seminar from Data Lab should appear there shortly. And we will basically see there that this is a methodology to really carve out, let's say the requirements from different use cases and we do this in race with so-called mural boards. So really multiple people can be at the same time, uh, basically at this whiteboard, as we have no physical interaction in the COVID time. We basically did this completely um, online. I'm currently in the process of sweeping through all the use cases and carve the ideas out. And you see from the problem, we really understand the general use case problem and then what data is available. Our basically focus today would be to understand what models do we have and can realize perhaps with the heat animals analytics toolkit, which is part of the architecture. It would be one tool we can basically employ in work package two in race to make it happen and also maybe contribute even with new developments. Right, so 
just for the, the general introduction for AI modeling, um, I don't want to take much more of your time just to the end. Think about where heat now sits uh, when you think the AI modeling process. Um, we said also the last time we basically have here uh, data mining, applied statistics, machine learning, and in the interaction, some data science, which also can use some computing. So in a way, there are lots of overlaps where basically people would say it's a data mining model or is it more a machine learning model? So there's not really a, a direct boundary perhaps, but there's a certain way of doing, let's say, um, aspects like supervised learning. So let's see a little bit how that looked like and where heat would be positioned in our building blocks on this. So essentially we have some data and it's coming out of a probability distribution. We would say that P on X um, that creates us some training examples. And this probability distribution we will never know. Basically we would try to get as close to it and have let's say a target function that was really creating perhaps as training examples. And we will never know this, so we kind of approximate this, but it's not so easy like just function approximation. Instead, we basically use this learning algorithms, and they always go together with a so-called hypothesis set. That is, so examples would be that I take a hypothesis set from support vector machines, and then I would have a learning algorithm of basically um, uh, quadratic programming. Then I would have a neural network, and then with basically the idea of using backpropagation. So a, a hypothesis set, a model of AI, usually comes with certain layer learning algorithms. And these need to be sometimes distributed, as we have seen. And here's the field where exactly tools like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and then combined maybe with Horovod and DeepSpeed make sense. And where we also can see then uh, where actually heat should play a role here. And of course, then the end of the game would be to get to some final hypothesis, which hopefully approximates this target function. This essentially was responsible for creating this training examples in the first place. And we're getting there by, let's say, uh, basically minimizing an error measure that we can, of course, define also depending on the different use cases and the learning algorithms we choose. That's just a big, let's say, picture of, uh, let's say, supervised learning example. And just to put in the context where heat could be a potential tool to find out uh, what we can use from it. Right, the key aspects, of course, then would be also for us to think about the data management, how we can use heat with um, basically all the data we have, which is for CFD simulations in the terabytes sometimes. So we talk really about big data. And then, of course, as I said earlier, the different parameters that you see here are in a way all different AI models. So how we can store these AI models, how we can reuse these AI models, maybe for transfer learning, would be also follow on questions to the HEAT framework at the end of the seminar, uh, which we will basically have here as examples just for remote sensing aspects that we will also tackle in this UE race project. Good. So in a way, I think I leave you on the table lots of different ideas where HEAT could play a role here in CU arrays. We have to learn actually where it's useful and what is the perspective of heat in this context. And I think without taking too much time, I would now give over to Claudia, if you're ready and stop my sharing here. Yes. I want to say hi first, hello. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to um, turn off my video because the network is not that great. Uh, yes, that's it. And let me go into sharing. I've cleaned up my desktop, Maurice. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> You can always, you know, uh, cut out of the video, but that is a bit more elegant, I would say. Uh, well, and it will be so tidy for about 10 minutes, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we see the slides, looks good. You see the slides look good. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for inviting us and, uh, and thanks everybody for showing up. I know for some of you, it's pretty early, I heard. So, um, 
um, yes, you have introduced me and, and Charlie. I also want to uh, bring up here Marcus Goetz, who's basically his mastermind, um, the, 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 the mind behind uh, this project. And uh, also Daniel Coughlin, especially, who has contributed humongous amounts of uh, ideas and code and is still one of the main uh, core developers in this project. Okay. And of course, all the other collaborators. <laughs> Let me get on with this. So it's going to be a longer presentation. Maurice, it's the first time I give an 18 minute presentation and I haven't really timed it. So I hope it works. Um, I'm going to have this uh, split up in two parts. So in the first part, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, its inner workings and uh, what's currently available in, in version 1.0. And um, in the second part, uh, well, I'm going to basically mention the, one of the pillars of the original uh, uh, heat idea, which is the fact that the library, well, and also one of the pillars of your project, uh, Maurice, the, the fact that the library is being co-designed, has been and is being co-designed by uh, its own first, uh, let's say, power users. So uh, we're going to show three examples of uh, early adopters, let's say, one from uh, neuroscience and uh, the other from uh, hydrogeological simulations or uh, terrestrial systems monitoring that you, Maurice, probably certainly know much more about than I. And the third is what we affectionately call our rocket science use case from the aerospace um, department. Um, that's going to be uh, presented by Charlie Davis, by the author herself. I hope you don't hear my road noises. If I close the window, I'm going to be cooked in one hour. So no, I'll leave it all open. good. Oh, all perfect. Good. All good. <laughs> okay. So. Next, let's get started then with uh, uh, with part one. And uh, first of all, let me give you a, a few words of uh, background on the on the project itself within which this library has taken shape. That's it was called the Helmholtz Analytics Framework, which actually was a, a three year uh, um, interdisciplinary pilot project or incubator project, as uh, the Helmholtz Association Association calls it. Um, that came to an end just now in March 21. Uh, I don't know how well versed you are in uh, German research. The Helmholtz Association is basically the largest scientific association in the country. And the uh, goal of the project, uh, or let's say the, the, the framework, so basically eight Helmholtz institutes coming from coming together from a completely different fields of applied science from uh, um, and mass or water bodies, hydrogeology, uh, to atmospheric science in this case, uh, modeling in this specific case, the, the effect of climate change on uh, uh, the distribution of uh, uh, stratospheric ozone. Then we had, a, we had actually two neuroscience uh, use cases. Uh, this specific figure was nicer. So <laughs> that's why it's here on the slide. It's, in this case, with, uh, uh, they're trying to disentangle um, uh, genetic uh, effects from, uh, say, exogenous or outside world uh, effects on, on the human brain. Then we have our, our, uh, our aerospace uh, use case, the design, designing of a virtual aircraft. And then uh, we had a, a structural biology uh, use case. So uh, basically trying to identify proteins or protein structure based on the very few bits of information that one can get from the massive amount of data that they have. So anyway, um, I'm showing five figures here, but they were really there were eight uh, institutes uh, with mostly one giant problem, which is they, were, they are all dealing with massive and increasing uh, data sets or model simulations. They all uh, have to get over uh, memory bottlenecks in order to carry out their research. They all need high performance computing, including uh, GPUs, of course. Um, they all uh, have uh, HPC applications available. 
and and need to port them to more uh, like modern uh, applications that would run on the uh, that would do well in the 2020s or uh, yeah in some cases they would have the their homegrown packages that they want to port to HPC and that's of course a significant effort as we know so the idea was to come together um, also given that they all use uh, similar they all have the same uh, uh, curse of dimensionality uh, problem so they all uh, use similar uh, methods to get over this dimensionality reduction machine learning neural networks so uh, the idea was to come up with a sort of a generalistic solution to this uh, common problem that's where heat comes in um, the idea with it was to provide a, a general general methods for uh, scientific big data analytics um, and that would come in the form of uh, a, a open source Python library. Our target audience isn't necessarily um, expert uh, HPC users. So actually we do see a need across all of science really uh, from all kinds of uh, research fields who, uh, from all kinds of researchers who have done uh, so far, who have done well with their uh, NumPy and SciPy applications. But now because of the uh, massive increase in uh, uh, data and uh, modeling uh, volumes, they find themselves in the position to have to port their, uh, uh, their SciPy, their NumPy to uh, uh, big clusters to HPC applications, and they don't have the training um, to do that. So our goal was to uh, really make it possible for uh, researchers to uh, parallelize their uh, calculations transparently. Okay. Okay, on, let me take a step back um, to the current uh, big data analytics landscape. And I think current, but this figure is from, or these graphics are from the, from last year, from the 2020. So it was probably outdated um, a week later, a week after coming out. So, uh, but anyway, don't worry about the single logos. What we want to highlight here with this slide um, is that, Python dominates the software landscape. And uh, from everything that's Python, NumPy and SciPy dominate the calculation, the, the, the uh, numerical cal calculations landscape. And typically, um, NumPy and SciPy users are uh, confined to a single node only. Um, from the hardware point of view, you can tell this slide is from Marcus. I would have written GPUs are queen Anyway, GPUs dominate, uh, of course, if you have a big number crunching to do. And uh, uh, at the same time, you have the problem that most, uh, or the, the, most, the most widely um, uh, available um, packages offer CPU support only. Um, the other thing is that there are uh, uh, many, many options for distribution engines or big data engines. Uh, you, there, there really is no problem to parallelize your calculation, calculations if you know your parallel programming. Um, next, uh, that's a slide that uh, Morris was looking forward to. <laughs> I think this is, as far as I'm concerned, an even more interesting illustration that I literally bumped into a year ago. Um, the source is the Intel Capital uh, um, news website. You can uh, check this post out in the link. Um, a small aside, I am uh, an outsider in this field. My background is in astrophysics. And so everything that helps me to, uh, to grasp the big picture, I, I, am just, I just love this stuff. So th I was really excited about these graphics. And at the time I was also, one year ago, I was also slightly annoyed that uh, heat apparently wasn't on their radar, on the, on the Intel radar. Uh, but it's still interesting to, to visualize this, uh, uh, to see where uh, heat stands now, one year later in this uh, AI stack. So let's see where I put in the logo. So certainly we are uh, at the library level. <laughs> and uh, uh, 
it's interesting that they call machine learning non-DL, so the non-deep learning part. So we, uh, uh, with it, we want to provide tools for uh, parallel uh, HVC machine learning. We provide tools for uh, neural networks, uh, data parallel neural networks at the moment, so deep learning. And uh, um, we certainly are a tool for data centers, for supercomputers. But we also fit in the distributed engine category because uh, uh, core of uh, heat, as I'm going to show you um, in a second, is uh, the distributed uh, data object. You okay, Morris? Should I leave it on for a while? <laughs> yeah, I'm still uh, on the 70s logo. And uh, <laughs> look it up. No, no joke. That's a really good overview, I guess. But yes, yes. I think also it's probably outdated very quickly. Absolutely. This was but also it gives outdated. the overall picture. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's very nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, let's get back to heat now and uh, uh, let me tell you about a bit of, uh, more about uh, about the library. So, Heat is basically a, a distributed tensor framework. Um, we insist on the uh, NumPy-like API. Um, we uh, make accelerated and, and distributed processing possible, including on uh, GPUs. And uh, it runs on. You know, it can run on uh, your uh, two cores on your laptop, or it, it, and the same code can run on on a, on a cluster uh, a supercomputer, um, and without having to change anything in the code. So uh, it's uh, the seamless use of GPUs and CPUs on clusters, on uh, personal personal workstations and HPC systems. That's really something we aimed at from the very start. Um, we also uh, provide uh, machine learning algorithms that are tailored to uh, uh, distribute a distributed data object, distributed data, I mean, memory distributed. And uh, uh, the high level algorithms are, um, yeah, the, the API is more like uh, uh, scikit-learn for the machine learning or non-DL as Intel says, uh, machine learning algorithms and more Python style for the neural, neural networks. So, ah, yes. So let me start with the core of the, of the, of the library. That's the heat data object called the DND array or uh, distributed n-dimensional array. I'm just going to give you an example here uh, so that, that you can uh, visually uh, uh, figure out how this works. Um, you would uh, basically import heat just like you import NumPy and you would also define an array um, just like you, you would define a, a, a NumPy array. So in this case, I'm defining a, a three-dimensional um, uh, data object called data and uh, the difference with uh, with respect in this case is the uh, the split attribute this is what enables basically the data distribution and what it means is that the data will be distributed along the first axis so just a bit more of a visual uh, uh, representation of this uh, if you have your uh, um, your uh, non-distributed data, there would be a, a data array with a speed equals known. And you would have basically a copy of this on every of you, on each one of your uh, processes. If you um, set the split attribute to zero, then uh, the data will be this, oh, this is a representation on three processes, sorry for not mentioning this earlier. Uh, you would have your uh, data uh, distributed along the zero dimension across the three processes and uh, uh, distributed and, and, and load balanced. If you instead, uh, you can of course pick every uh, axis uh, that's available in your uh, data set. So if you set split to one in this case, it would be uh, distributed across the three processes along the rows. And uh, in this specific case, if you use split equals two, it would be distributed along the uh, columns. I hope that's um, clear. Uh, check out our uh, paper to have a, a detailed description of the uh, programming model. 
I also have a link to the paper later in a, a later slide, I think. Okay, so um, programming model. So we are using a sort of variation of the bug synchronous parallel model. So the, 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 I'm not a computer scientist, so forgive every misuse of terminology, but uh, um, the bug synchronous parallel model in this case represented on four, uh, 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 on four processes, your uh, calculations start and you have regular uh, synchronizations among all your uh, processes and uh, then they start again at some point, uh, you get to the, 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 the calculations are carried out in parallel, but there is this uh, uh, regular synchronizing um, among uh, processes. So what we do is a sort of a synchronous variation to that, um, which means, uh, the data are distributed, as I uh, showed in the figure earlier, the calculations start and, uh, uh, and then if at any point in the calculations, data need to be made available from, uh, in this case, for example, from one process to another for whatever uh, reason, or uh, the synchronization among all processes need, need to happen, then in this case, there is, a, there is a synchronization, there is transfer of data communication among processes. Um, otherwise, there is no inbuilt, uh, you know, regular uh, synchronization among the processes. Okay, so yeah, uh, maybe I've already mentioned it earlier, maybe not uh, the, so, uh, Process local data objects are actually PyTorch tensors. And uh, uh, that means also that process local uh, functions are uh, uh, PyTorch functions. That's why we can be so fast in spite of being a pure, <laughs> a pure Python library. And then uh, communication among processes is uh, of course via, uh, via message passing interface and MPI for Py. Okay. So next, um, let's talk about low, low level operations. We wanted to provide basically NumPy operations that are under the hood uh, um, implemented to, uh, uh, to uh, run basically in parallel, to, to be parallelized from uh, from the start, but that the main thing is that the user doesn't need to, to know anything about how the uh, parallelism within the functions or within the operations is implemented. So ideally, uh, we really orient ourselves really strongly to, uh, uh, to the NumPy API. I, our guiding light is to be able to import heat as NumPy. It's not 100% possible, of course, uh, but um, that's our, uh, uh, our guiding light, as I said. Uh, we provide uh, already in the current implementation lots of uh, uh, distributed low level operations, linear algebra, reduction operations, binary operations, manipulations as well. Um, we have uh, uh, parallel IO and um, also multi GPU support, uh, thanks to uh, MPI where uh, CUDA, no, sorry, CUDA where MPI. <clears throat> Um, yes, and if you wanted to uh, basically run your calculations, whatever they are on a GPU, uh, one way of doing it would be like you would do for a, for a torch tensor to uh, set the device um, of your uh, uh, data to, to GPU, uh, otherwise the default would be CPU. There is also an easier way to set the device at the beginning for, uh, for all of the uh, data objects that you will allocate. So let's see a bit more uh, visually how this works. Okay, I'm going to import heat as heat so that we don't mix up things too much. <laughs> heat as HT. And uh, um, yeah, I'm assuming you have this uh, a file or array or a tensor that, that's, uh, that you can basically wrap you know, into a, a heat DND array or a heat array. In this case, as you can see, I haven't specified the split attribute or argument. So uh, that means that X will be basically copied uh, on every process. 
um, okay, this is not what you need heat for, so let's switch to a bit more uh, of a distributed setup. Um, you can uh, uh, load X with the uh, split zero, that means it would be split along the rows. And then you might want to load your uh, Y matrix uh, and uh, split along the columns, because maybe what you have in mind is to, uh, to uh, perform a, a, a dot product on these two uh, arrays. So in this case, each process contains basically a slice uh, of the data. So uh, a slice along the rows for X, a slice along the columns for Y. The slices are uh, um, load balanced and the uh, dot function that is implemented uh, to uh, carry out this calculation in parallel. So whatever calculation needs to happen locally happens via, um, via a torch function. And whenever communication is needed, uh, then you will have a, a MPI communication already implemented uh, in the function. So you end up basically with a distributed dot product of those two uh, arrays or those two matrices. Um, afterwards, what do you want to do? I, you can do whatever you want. You can uh, have a reduction operation, for example, on, uh, on your uh, uh, dot products. You can uh, sum along the zero axis, then you would have a, uh, a copy of this sum on every, uh, on every uh, process because the, the split axis would be lost. You would have a, a T with split equals known. You can reshape, you can transpose, uh, you can do statistics, matrix multiplication, all kind of stuff. You better uh, check this out on, on our, uh, uh, you better check the library out because I, I cannot go through all the functions that are already implemented. That's a huge list. Uh, what I want to point out here is the redistribute. That's not really a, a NumPy function. Of course, you might find yourself in the situation of having to basically redistribute your data because uh, you've started out, it was convenient to you to start out with say split equal zero. And at some point you want to redistribute the, the data to be, to be distributed along the columns, then you can do that within heat. Of course, it's a very um, in intensive operation that uh, you should use uh, uh, with care as Charlie can tell you all about this if you're interested. Okay, next. Oh yeah, so I'm um, getting out of the low-level operations now and switching to uh, uh, parallel or distributed machine learning. I'm not going to say so much about this because we have a few examples later, uh, again from uh, Charlie, but what I want to mention is that, that all our uh, uh, high-level algorithms uh, are as I said, optimized for uh, uh, memory distributed and load balanced computations. So, so far we have k-means and, and company and friends. Uh, uh, Gaussian naive base. I'm not sure if there's something else has come to join the join this group uh, lately. Um, what I want to show here is that. Uh, uh, as far as uh, high-level algorithms or machine learning algorithms are concerned, uh, we stick to the scikit-learn API so that you would basically load the data um, um, again with the heat, uh, heat uh, <laughs> peculiarity of uh, specifying the, the distribution axis. And then basically run your k-means, or uh, yes, exactly as you would uh, run k-means on uh, uh, on uh, scikit-learn. Again, Charlie is going to show you more about this, I think, later. Okay, uh, I suppose everybody wants to hear about performance. <laughs> um, as I said, we do care a lot about the. Uh, HPC compliant implementation of this uh, of functions and algorithms under the hood. So we do pay a lot of attention to uh, minimizing communication and uh, to memory details. 
Um, and in the benchmarks that we have uh, carried out for our paper last year, we did observe a, a significant speed up with respect to, uh, for example, the dusk cupi uh, couple, uh, unique cupi for uh, uh, to, to use dusk on uh, on GPUs. Uh, you can check out our benchmarks on our GitHub repository. I'm just going to show you a couple of plots. I'm not going to say much about it because I think Ch Charlie is going to also mention these plots uh, later. So this was just one of the four or five benchmarks we have in the paper. Um, uh, one uh, use case, let's say, that was the uh, pairwise Euclidean distances on a, a huge five million entries uh, data set with uh, uh, 18 features. And uh, um, this is the weak scaling, having a constant workload on each on each MPI process. You can see that. Uh, okay, so x scale. A fraction of nodes is because uh, each node had uh, in our setup four GPUs. So <laughs> if you uh, uh, see a, a fractional node is because we were only using a fraction of the chip GPUs there. Um, the CPUs are the uh, turquoise points for a PyTorch and uh, the, no, sorry, yeah, the circles are the CPUs and the squares are the GPU uh, experiments and wide scale is runtime. So in this case, uh, smaller is uh, better. And you can see that the the heat GPU performance is uh, uh, significantly better, uh, of course, than, uh, than the CPU, but especially the heat CPU is significantly better than dusk. Um, yes, so I also have another plot on the uh, strong scaling. In this case, the Y scale is the speed up versus the uh, single node NumPy run. So in this case, uh, Higher is better. And even here, you can see that um, heat uh, outperformed dusk in these tests, both in the, in the CPU and in the uh, GPU case. I want to point out that these benchmarks are, again, about one year old. So in the meantime, we have found, uh, we, I, I think there has been a lot of work in heat uh, to improve performance. And I, I am assuming that there has been a lot of work uh, on Dusk as well. So we will certainly uh, run these benchmarks again this year to see where we stand um, and how things have changed. So that's a, a 2020 stand. Okay. So I think somebody was interested in neural networks. Uh, I am... Uh, um, then, uh, as far as uh, parallel neural networks are concerned, I am basically taking off on a tangent. Um, this is this is a new feature that's been uh, uh, released with version 1.0 in April, and I am literally taking off on a different slide deck. This was uh, provided by Daniel Cochlin, who also is a, uh, the main author of this. Uh, um, of this feature. So within heat, uh, we, version 1.0, we now have uh, uh, an accelerated neural network training with uh, DAZO, which is the uh, distributed asynchronous and selective optimization method that uh, Daniel and collaborators have uh, uh, figured out. Let me, is if Charlie is online, she might uh, uh, correct me if I say something wrong. Uh, if not, she will correct me later. So uh, a bit of an intro on, on parallel neural networks. Of, although, of course, you know a lot more than this. Uh, you a lot, a lot more about this than I. But uh, the um, three main ways to uh, parallelize training would be like the, the data uh, parallelism uh, with. Uh, networks basically reproduce on all uh, data are distributed on, on uh, many on the processes and the networks are mirrored on all, on all of the processes then there would be model parallelism where uh, uh, the uh, network layers are distributed and then there's pipelining where the uh, network is uh, uh, 
divided by or distributed by layer. Uh, what we have implemented in HEAT is a data parallelism option. And uh, um, well, so basically we perform a SGD or sort of stochastic gradient descent. And uh, as you know, parameters must be uh, synchronized across uh, processes and also within processes. If you have a, a group of GPU, GPUs like uh, most uh, HPC architecture uh, does. So, um, this step can be optimized by using asynchronous communication when synchronizing, but nevertheless, this is, uh, the synchronization itself is one of the most prominent training bottlenecks um, as far as uh, runtime is concerned. So what Daniel and friends have come up with is DAZO, where the distributed asynchronous and selective optimization um, which allows you to re really cut down on, on training time. Um, and the buzzwords here are asynchronous and selective. So the idea is to reduce communication overhead and uh, um, increase speed by uh, not uh, synchronizing at every iteration, let's say, but uh, having a selective global updates. So uh, the global synchronization then uh, in DAZO is uh, uh, divided in three steps. There's a local synchronization and the global synchronization. And then after the global synchronization, a local update. So the local synchronization is a sort of traditional uh, way it kind of happens uh, as far as I understand uh, uh, pretty much after every iteration or batch as the expert call it. <laughs> and then um, the global synchronization instead uh, doesn't happen at every iteration. So we have uh, one uh, GPU per node that is uh, a member of an MPI group and communicates the parameters with the other nodes. Um, and uh, Average uh, averaging operation only occurs within this MPI group, and then this uh, selected, say, GPU speaker uh, um, broadcasts the data to the local GPU group, and this, of course, happens uh, asynchronously, so that so that uh, uh, um, we do end up saving a lot of time, apparently. I'm not going to go through the details unless you have questions, in which case I might bring up this uh, slide later. Here is a, a snippet, a code snippet. Um, it basically follows uh, PyTorch, uh, uh, the PyTorch uh, implementation of uh, um, neural networks training. But I think the plot that you might be most interested in is that in recent benchmarks, um, by about 30%, without uh, losing too much, uh, without losing accuracy, actually. You, I hope you hear me. My computer complains that uh, no, all network good. is all unstable. Good. Okay. <laughs> Fine. No, very good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this would be a, a, the summary slide for uh, the neural network. So um, can you train a PyTorch neural net? Can PyTorch neural networks a parallel uh, data set with the? Uh, uh, can you train a PyTorch neural networks with a heat data set? Yes. You can use PyTorch functions within training, which uh, speeds things up quite a bit. Yes. You can use the PyTorch data loader. Um, you can, that's the most important thing, train with a data set which, which does not fit into the available single memory. So you don't have to load the data on one, uh, on a single node memory in order to distribute them to, uh, uh, to the other processes. That's the main thing. And we can also train a network faster than Horobot. So check out the paper that's on archive. 
And there's a link here in case you get the PDF slides later, but also please check out our tutorial on our GitHub page. Okay, any questions so far? Quick question, um, can you hear me? Yeah. I uh, just wanted to make sure how much effort would it be? So let's say you have a PyTorch model. Um, I mean, I think these questions you have on this slide actually might already answer my question, but I just want to make sure. So given I have, let's say a PyTorch model um, and um, the training, what, which was written on PyTorch, but can be changed, of course, how much effort would it be to use uh, DASO in this case? So I, my understanding is that it wouldn't be too much effort. You would have to uh, load the data into a heat data set so that it's distributed. That would be the main thing, right? You would, you would want to distribute the data. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think it should be straightforward. I don't know if Charlie's online, but you can, you should uh, in any case, check out this, uh, the tutorial because uh, the idea is really, sorry, hang on, let me go back. Is really to uh, basically follow uh, the PyTorch implementation for, uh, uh, for neural networks training so that you don't have to do much. Okay, and just to make sure. Ah, sorry, go ahead. Hi, Claudia. Sorry, um, just because you mentioned it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, basically, the problem is just loading the data, but since DASO only wraps the PyTorch models and trains these as like um, node local models, it's really not much of a hassle. So your biggest concern will be your data loader. Um, but considering that if you have data that is uh, in, in samples already individually, so say you have images um, also, then this is also not a big problem. It, it gets a bit more tricky if you have like one file where your huge data set is in there. So for it, say, for example, you have a huge HDF5 file. That's also possible. However, it gets a bit more tricky, but considering that most researchers have their data as in like large folders, for example, if how you have with ImageNet, then it's really not a hassle. Thank you. And does this also, this applies mainly to the data parallel models, right? Or data parallel training, let's say. Yes, that's what is data parallel training. Okay, thank you. I would like to add, if it becomes a hassle, please get in touch with us. Uh, don't let this stop you. Uh, we are uh, really eager to help you out. Okay. So let me see oh, we were done here. Yes, check out our tutorial and then are we done? Ah, yeah. So hang on, in case uh, some of you have, uh, some of your uh, cumulative attention has been drifting before we go on to the next part, there are a few points I want to uh, drive home now. So let's have a bit of a summary. Um, the main thing with heat is that you can bypass your, I, I would say the absolute main thing, the, the main thing where, that you would say, okay, really I need to use this library now is that you can bypass your, uh, uh, your memory bottleneck. As I said earlier, you don't need to load your data on a single node in order to distribute them. The moment you load the data in a, in a heat uh, array, um, each process automatically basically gets a slice of the data without having to uh, load the whole data set first. So that's one of the main points that I that it's for us so obvious that I, I haven't really uh, mentioned it openly in the beginning. So the other thing I want to drive home then is that uh, with heat, you can basically carry out uh, HPC or a distributed parallel low level operations statistic, linear algebra, and so on with a NumPy-like uh, API. And this should make it really easy to port your NumPy code to heat. Of course, have we implemented all NumPy functions? Certainly not. There will be things that you need and that we haven't implemented yet. And please get in touch with us, request new features. That's uh, very important to us. So the other thing is that we have a, the, the machine learning part. Uh, clustering classification and, and so on. That's more uh, scikit-learn-like. 
even here, of course, we don't have all the uh, algorithms that, uh, that scikit-learn has. Um, if you need something, ask. We might uh, collaborate. We will be happy to collaborate on that. And the other thing that you can do with, uh, with HEAT at the moment is data parallel uh, neural networks training, and that's more a PyTorch-like. Um, a PyTorch-like uh, API, or certainly it is a pre pretty much a PyTorch API. At the core of all of this, as, uh, as I said, is the distributed uh, n-dimensional array that allows you to basically bypass your memory bottleneck. Okay. What have we got next? Ah, in practice, so I'm going to pu <laughs> push my luck now and um reach to firefox let's see what happens so the best way to well there are two good ways to get started depending on how interactive you want to be uh, the best way is probably to just uh, pip install heat uh, go to the uh, pypy project page and uh, i'm going to actually click on this and see what happens we tried this earlier ah it works <laughs> somebody say yes Uh, we see it. Yeah, Great. yeah, yeah. we see it. Awesome. Everything good. <laughs> awesome. So this is uh, uh, the PyVy project page. You can see the latest version was released end of April. We are actually planning for 1.1. Uh, actually, <laughs> we wanted to release it last week. In the end, we didn't manage. So I think this is a really, uh, uh, the 1.1 is going to come out shortly. Hopefully this week, we have some indexing fixes especially and uh, performance enhancement but anyway here you you can basically read up everything that you need in order to get started we have uh, tutorials this would lead you to the github tutorial uh, that's a jupyter notebook but you can also go um, straight to the documentation i'm going to click on here and see what happens <laughs> Charlie, you want to say something about the docs? <laughs> nope. <Don't mention> it. <laughs> this was a major, major effort to have our wonderful docs look so great. And uh, Charlie was uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, <laughs> seminar in doing this. Um, yes, so uh, through the documentations, you can get to the heat tutorials. This is quite nice, actually. I only discovered recently. And uh, uh, you have a 30-minute uh, uh, tutorial for beginners, uh, then uh, something on parallel computing, which is pretty much what I showed you earlier, and then cluster analysis. Let me go through this if you're interested. OK, DND arrays is pretty much what I showed earlier. Operations, these are low-level operations, binary operations. Um, I think you can go through this on your own. Parallel computing, you can also go through this on your own. It's pretty much what I showed earlier, uh, how to uh, uh, enable data distribution basically via the split argument. Okay, I'm going fast, but I think this is really not something Ah, that's the programming model also from the paper. So that's uh, a bit more uh, a detailed explanation there. I'm going to go back because you can all understand this on your own. We also have a cluster analysis um, tutorial. I'm sure that uh, Charlie is going to show some clustering later, so I'm not going to go into uh, details here, but you can see that. Um, we can basically, you can basically go through the tutorials and uh, the iris data sets. Uh, you can't do anything without the iris data sets. <laughs> you can go through the tutorials and get a good idea of uh, how to use the library, which is pretty much like scikit-learn in this case. Okay, let me see anything else I wanted to show here. 
um, documentation, tutorials. Yes, I've mentioned 1.1 coming soon. Then the next way to get started uh, or a more interactive way would be of course to go to our uh, GitHub repository where you can uh, clone the state of the art main branch and uh, tutorials and the benchmarks uh, as well. I guess that they will go, are going to be updated soon. Um, the most important thing for us, of course, is that you get in touch with us via issues. Don't worry about, you know, don't worry if you think that it might be a, a, a stupid questions. I mean, I'm the uh, stupid asker on duty, so there's no way you're going to out stupid me. Uh, um, that's uh, uh, just get in touch. That's the most important thing. We know that uh, porting, uh, for example, NumPy to heat is sometimes not exactly straightforward. And that's exactly what we want to hear about because we want to have it straightforward. Okay, next, Outlook. Work in progress for now. Um, well, Marcus Gutz is the uh, high performance DB scan person. So he this package is available, but not on heat. So uh, the uh, next, uh, uh, what we will be busy next, I think this year, maybe in early next year is to uh, make this available uh, to uh, uh, seamless, seamlessly uh, via heat. And then uh, the, uh, neuroscience asset package that I'm going to tell you about later is also something that I've been uh, working on a lot. Um, we have several, uh, we have had several uh, bachelor students and have at the moment, I think one or two, uh, including uh, Lena Blin, who is, uh, uh, well, her dream work is, uh, <laughs> um, Dynamic DMD, oh, dynamic da 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 decomposition, <laughs> dynamic modeling decomposition or something. Yes, and uh, so that needs singular value decomposition. And uh, so that's what's been actively worked on at the moment. Dynamic, yeah, I'll come up with it as soon as I'm done with the talk, I'm sure. Um, we are constantly working on performance enhancement. Um, uh, having a continuous, continuous benchmarking, uh, uh, like we have continuous uh, integration uh, would be fantastic. It's something we would like to have uh, this year. We're working on visual, we, visualization as well on the, on the side. And um, um, we have some pretty massive uh, uh, work package. It's a custom tensor communication. Uh, it's at the moment a separated uh, package. It's called MPI for Torch. You can have a look at it. This will, will enable once it's merged into heat um, parallel automatic differentiation. If you have questions, uh, Charlie here is the perfect person to answer that. Um, we also have a possible Intel collaboration. We did show up on the radar at some point. So that would be more about the, the NumPy part. So the, the, the uh, what we call the low level uh, operations part, the, the distributed NumPy uh, package. But this is all uh, um, not settled yet. Okay, so this side would be the uh, stuff that we are more like really working on already. Uh, what is more in the back of our mind and we need to, we know we need to start working on it or uh, we plan to start working on it in the not too distant future is of course, sparse operations. It would be uh, something that we really need has been asked by, by several use cases already. Um, we would like to support other GPU vendors and not just uh, NVIDIA. We know that, that PyTorch can uh, do it now. Uh, so that will also be an, an incoming uh, update. But of course, on this list could be just as well your use case. Um, please bring things up. That's why we are here. Bring, bring up uh, your needs and uh, but as Morris, not but, but and, and as Morris said earlier, uh, the most important thing is to realize that um, 
we need to collaborate. So we, we would really uh, need uh, contribution to the development um, in order to uh, address uh, like more complex uh, things at the moment outside of the plan that we have already. Okay, so I guess um, I could switch to part two unless uh, we want to, I don't know, take a break or... No, thank you very questions. much. I think we would maybe take the questions later because then okay. we can have them maybe in the full light also of the second presentation that is coming. Um, and also to ensure that we're not running too much out of time. Yes. So if, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Charlotte is ready, then I would say proceed to the second talk. Okay, shall we go straight to, okay, I have three use cases, oh, yeah. but we can actually... Um, uh, no, please we, go ahead. Please okay. go ahead with your plan. No, I thought actually Charlotte takes care of the second part. Go then. <laughs> yeah, she please does. Take, yeah. <laughs> we have time, we have time, okay. no stress. Fine. Perfect. <laughs> Okay, so uh, as I said earlier, um, the main thing with it is that it has been co-designed by the uh, uh, what, what would be the early adopters then. Uh, the first uh, project I want to mention is uh, a project called or a package called ASSET. It is a, a, the vague topic is neuroscience. And um, mm, Basically, what this is very much work in progress. I hope to be done with this <laughs> this summer. Uh, basically, what they're doing is uh, uh, analyzing uh, what ESSET is for is analysis of sequences of synchronous events. So, what they're doing is analyzing analyzing um, time series, statistical anal analysis of time series. They call them spike trains, which are basically time series of uh, of neurons firing at some specific, uh, after some specific triggers. And uh, the goal there is to find out what, which of these uh, <laughs> triggers or which of, of these uh, firing spike trains correspond to actual um, um, cortical connections or uh, actually cor correspond to the same trigger. Uh, so actually, ASSET is already an MPI optimized and, and uh, uh, GPU accelerated uh, NumPy package. It was pretty perfect for us because we really took it as a starting point. It was uh, when, when we started developing heat, we really took ASSET and said, okay, what functions do we need here? What NumPy functions? Um, and so, as I said, it is already an MPI optimized and, and, uh, and GPU accelerated package, but they still run into a, this huge memory bottleneck that I uh, mentioned earlier. Um, if they want to uh, run their statistical analysis on their uh, entire data set, which in this case is like 16 minutes of data with the millisecond size bins, and uh, they have uh, this data in, uh, in uh, sparse uh, arrays and then, and the sparse arrays do fit in memory, but uh, when uh, this is our SciPy uh, sparse arrays, they do fit in the data. Um, the dot product, the sparse dot product does not fit in a single node memory. And SciPy of course uh, is a single node library. So this is where, um, uh, the, their current solution, of course, is to chop the data up and uh, run the analysis on uh, different on, on separate chunks of the data. But the idea uh, or why they need it is to uh, run the whole the analysis on the whole data set. And uh, basically, what we've done here is uh, this is also something I want to show you. Heat is just like pretty much any other Python library. You can plug it in with other libraries and uh, use heat, for example, to distribute the data and then switch over to uh, your, uh, uh, your whatever library you want to use or the other way around in this case. In this case, what I'm doing is uh, X and Y are process local, right? They're, uh, uh, they're not distributed, they're process local on each process, um, but the dot product doesn't fit in memory. So what I've been doing here is I have basically run the dot product on different slices of the uh, of 
of the sparse um, SciPy arrays. So basically in the end, I ended up with uh, um, like a slice of a, uh, of a distributed dot product. The problem here is, of course, you can do this uh, without heat. You don't need heat at all uh, to get to this point. But of course, then here you have uh, your however many slices of your dot products on uh, um, on your processes, and uh, they don't know about each other. So that's where it's handy to uh, basically then wrap the sparse, uh, sorry, the dense representation of uh, um, of these slices into heat. And uh, uh, hang on, and uh, um, and then you basically have them in a in a heat in the array, which is pretty much an MPI wrapper around this data. So that afterwards, you can run all your uh, NumPy operations, uh, reshape, unique, um, you know, whatever some diff. These operations on the on the distributed data, and you will basically run these operations. Uh, you will run the, the HPC uh, implementation of these operations. So you don't need to gather your data again, uh, which you you can't in this case to uh, to run your uh, fast NumPy operations. And I have, uh, I think I have crossed out the MPI uh, part here. This is uh, uh, referring to the slide I showed you earlier about the distributed dot product. In this case, I didn't need any communicate MPI communication because the, because X and Y are basically uh, process local. So there is no communication involved here. The only communication is afterwards when you uh, run your uh, distributed or parallel operations on, uh, on the distributed uh, dot product. Okay. Uh, I think I can skip that. Uh, so this is nice. <laughs> I mean, I want to mention this. Uh, uh, um, heatifying asset also give me, gave me quite a, a, a nice insight on heatifying NumPy code in general. So I can give you a bit of a warning. Um, after spending about a year with the, well, not 100% of the time, but with this project, please expect some frustration we have resolved a lot of the problems uh, that, that we have uh, encountered uh, along the way, but still you will find things where your uh, NumPy frame of mind doesn't really match the heat frame of mind. And uh, uh, please absolutely let us know, get in touch because we can uh, help you overcome these hurdles uh, faster, hopefully. Um, yes. Yeah, one thing I want to mention is because we work so much with, uh, or we expect to work with GPU, um, for example, uh, NumPy uh, arrays are by default, I think, 64-bit uh, arrays, and we often default to 32-bit arrays. So that's one thing, for example, that so when you're comparing uh, uh, your uh, heat results to your uh, uh, NumPy results, sometimes might might uh, make problems, so just be aware of that. Okay, I don't need to go into so much detail. The other um, use case I had is uh, terrestrial monitoring and forecasting. Actually, Morris should give this talk because he knows so much more about this than I. This is from the Institute of Bio and Geosciences in Newlish. Uh, again, I'm basically switching to a different uh, slide deck. Um, what this use case is working on is uh, basically uh, working out with uh, observations and uh, simulations and modeling the very complex inter interactions uh, and, uh, and feedback between uh, uh, land mass and uh, uh, the water cycle and so on. So this is really complex. If you need details, please ask Morris, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm going to show you a couple uh, pictures because they're very nice. They have, of course, massive, uh, both data volumes and uh, uh, simulation volumes uh, to juggle. And uh, they well, are I could maybe out, out just one thing, maybe on the yeah. last slide. Um, I think by because it's relevant for CU rates, yes, 
also, I guess, what we look here is that there are actually three different um, GPI, uh, MPI models running partly in these path flow aspects. So they have this groundwater modeling, then they have one which is more about the, let's say, um, the groundwater and the surface. And then, of course, also about the um, the aspect that come out of the climate. So they actually run with an Oasis coupler, three different MPI applications sometimes together. And I think this is also from the coupling perspective, a bit what we could see in RAISE when we have an AI model running coupled together with a simulation running. This is of course not necessarily path flow here or this constellation, but maybe then a computation fluid dynamics code. But I think this is an interesting use case also in that regard, but please carry on. I mean, the details are not, not so important, I guess. We are anyway looking more on the AI framework idea of heat. Thanks a lot, Maurice. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, these pictures I want to show you, they just demonstrate the, uh, the big data problem here. I don't think we need to go into much details, except they're really nice. Um, the challenge is, of course, is how to cope with the large data volumes that, that, that are getting larger and larger. Um, so what they are, they want to use heat for um, is uh, uh, for post-processing, actually, for post-processing the diagnostics uh, or, uh, you know, uh, analysis after the power flow run. I'm not going to go into so much detail, but they have been major contributors to, um, to heat. Actually, Daniel Coughlin that I mentioned earlier um, has been working with them and because and, and uh, contributed to heat uh, from the point of view of this use case uh, for the first two years, I think, in the project. Even though now he, he's at uh, KIT as well. Um, yes, and uh, even now they there is a really uh, close interaction with their current uh, developer Ben Borgard, who is really a great uh, a great Python uh, developer, and uh, has a, a really uh, lots of good insights. We come more all from the science side, so uh, he's a he's a big help sometimes or often. Okay, I just saw the contributions. We don't need to go through that. It's basically uh, huge uh, statistical calculations on uh, uh, 2D and 3D uh, tensors. What they have been doing, actually Ben's um, bachelor thesis in 2019 has been on benchmarking heat. And now I think he's still uh, 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 carrying out this uh, this ben benchmarking uh, of uh, heat compared to the other applications that they have available uh, all the time, and they seem really convinced that uh, that using heat for their post processing is the way to go. They've actually also started to uh, propagate this uh, um, in the community. As far as I know, the uh, up the the heatified let's say they are heat. not uh, released yet so they're, they're still working on it but yeah, i'm really looking forward to to play with this uh, when it's out so watch this space and next yeah so i wasn't sure if charlie was going to mention this but this paper of hers won the best paper award and i'm going to just uh, give her the stage Go ahead, Charlie. Yes, <laughs> thank you. I'm going um, to be your uh, slide changer. <laughs> um, I actually figured, um, since I wasn't sure whether you put this in PDF, um, I, that I can share the slides now on my screen since this is the uh -huh. last part. I think it should be possible. Yeah. Um, let's see if this works. OK, I'm going to stop uh, sharing then. OK. okay. No. Thanks, Claudia. While actually um, Charlotte is getting the slides up, I think it was a very nice overview talk. 
of course, it's understandable that you're not having the details of all the different applications and so on. Oh, no, that's what that's I like it. most about what the biggest fun in this project has come from not having to understand all the little details and just uh, being able to work on the on solving the problems. Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> now we heard then from Charlotte and I'm very sorry that I misspelled your name in the beginning. Somehow I had a French uh, Charlotte, I know. That's why I thought it's kind of French. But uh, yeah, so we're looking forward to your talk and uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, can you all see my slides? Is this working? Yeah, works well. Yeah. Perfect, perfect. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to present some of the stuff um, that um, some of the work I did at the German Aerospace Center, um, I am not with DLR anymore. Um, since October, I have switched to KIT. Um, but in both centers, I have um, also worked with Claudia on heat. And I'm now going to show you some use case data where um, heat was actually employed. Um, to some analysis, that would have been way more difficult without the distribution. Um, so the, 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 the topic was high performance data analytics of hybrid rocket fuel combustion data. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know, which pretty much, um, I guess a lot of you don't, I didn't know before I came to, K uh, to DLR either, what are hybrid rocket engines? So conventional um, hybrid rockets have fuel um, that's either completely li liquid or, um, uh, or solid. And for these rocket engines, you need like two components um, of, for the combustion. One is the fuel and one is the oxidizer in order to actually burn the fuel. And hybrid rockets have been um, heavily researched in the last um, decade because they provide some advantages over the conventionally used liquid, liquid ones. Um, for example, since the fuel and the oxidizer are stored differently and in separate compartments, that makes these rocket engines way safer. Um, I think we all like have images um, of, uh, ro uh, of, of rocket launches that did not go so well. Luckily, it's been quite some time since this, this happened. Um, with this safer um, state of storage also comes reduced production cost because um, it's just easier to store these components. And hybrid rocket engines have the advantage that you have controllable thrust. So basically, you, you can easily turn them on and off again. Um, one of these um, hybrid fuels is based on paraffin. Um, the, um, the, the, the principle behind this is that paraffin, while burning, has a very low viscosity and low surface tension, um, and thus a thin liquid surface layer forms, um, and through the flow of the oxidizer over this paraffin, um, the, there are droplets um, taken off from this low viscosity, low uh, surface tension area, um, and this enhances the, the fuel surface. And by this, um, these, the, these paraffin-based hybrid fuels can actually enhance regression rate, which is currently the biggest problem of them. They are cheap and safe, but they don't burn, like they don't provide as much thrust as um, the liquid ones. Um, and the goal of some experiments at DLR was to actually um, characterize this droplet and uh, entrainment process um, and the entire um, combustion dynamics. And therefore, um, the Institute of um, uh, Space Propulsion has an optical, um, an, an optical setup where they can, with a high speed video camera, um, basically film um, the combustion of such fuels. Um, and they recall these images um, at an at a, at a, uh, imaging rate of uh, 10,000 frames per second. And a typical combustion goes uh, three to 10 seconds. So we are left with a, a minimum of 30,000 images, um, all somewhere between uh, to 1,000 times 200 pixels. Um, and this is actually where things get interesting because this is high resolution, big video data uh, that needs to be analyzed. I, this is why I had to switch to PowerPoint. Um, this is a video of how such a combustion looks like. Um, and you can see like the lower dark part is the, the fuel slab, the paraffin, um, and on top there is this burning. And sometimes you see these little splatters um, occurring in there. 
Um, so the aim was to obviously um, relate to machine learning um, in order to quantify um, this, this, this combustion process and uh, importantly to identify short-term turbulence because this might indicate um, lesser um, favorable uh, fuel um, uh, compositions. But as I said, we have a very large data set um, so this was the, 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 the wish to go to heat um, and to use a distributed set, a setting to analyze this data. Um, in order to analyze the data, we relate to clustering techniques. Um, the first um, most well-known, basically the simplest, but also well-established one would be k-means clustering. I'm sure you're all familiar. Um, just uh, briefly, k-means um, tries to iteratively minimize the within cluster variance. So um, the difference between these so-called centroids and the data points, and then in an iterative process, assigns all data points to one of those centroids, recalculates um, the, the, the center of mass or the centroid, and this continues until the um, algorithm converges. The problem is that k-means uh, definitely um, suffers the curse of dimensionality, and uh, more importantly, the computation time grows with the number of clusters um, that are being used. Um, another algorithm um, that we intended to look at is spectral clustering. Spectral clustering originates from graph theory. Um, and the idea is from your data set to build a, 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 a so-called um, graph Laplacian, um, the Laplacian matrix that is assembled by basically the similarity between each uh, pair of data points, and then um, find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this Laplacian matrix, because the k um, lowest eigenvectors then provide a lower dimensional um, embedded representation of the data set. And thus, instead of clustering all data sets with a lot of features that we have for image data, we have less, less features, basically K, um, that we can then cluster more easily. And an advantage in spectral clustering is the so-called spectral gap. I'm sure each one of you who has worked with clustering techniques before knows the problem of having to manually choose uh, the number of clusters. With spectral clustering, there is a hint to find the optimal number of clusters because it is the multiplicity of the zero eigenvector, uh, eigenvalue. Um, on the right hand side, you can see an example. Um, this is just a, a toy, toy data set with four different clusters. And if you plot the, uh, the sorted eigenvalues, you can see that after four, so from the fourth eigenvalue on, there is a, a large gap uh, or a jump. And this indicates that four is actually the suitable number because it hints at the number of um, disconnected components in your graph of Um But you can already see the problem that we might get uh, into with spectral clustering if we have a lot of samples. We need to calculate um, in order to build the graph in the similarity matrix. And this requires pairwise distance calculations. Um, so 30,000 uh, times 30,000 ca uh, calculations. And then on top of this, of this 30,000 by 30,000 matrix, we need to find the eigenvalue decomposition. Also a non-trivial problem. Um, and this is a part where um, we actually started to develop an algorithm for heat that can handle this. Um, and the, the, the major uh, challenge was this uh, uh, computation of the pairwise distances. And Claudia has already shown you um, a very short scaling plot. Uh, it's a bit odd um, to choose this one because it's actually the one from an HPC point of view that scales rather poorly. Um, and I would like to take now a few uh, minutes to explain to you how this algorithm works, how we actually manage to compute um, such a large matrix, and also maybe why it doesn't scale optimally. So imagine you have your data set, um, and each process, in this case we have four processes, holds a local chunk of the data. Um, usually for these kinds of analysis, we resort to sample splitting, 
Um, so along the x-axis or di dimension zero, we have the samples that are distributed across, across processes, um, and uh, each process just holds a chunk of all the samples with all the features in it. Um, the first step is that each process locally can compute the pairwise distances between the samples that, that it holds. And this forms for our um, uh, similarity matrix, basically the, 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 the diagonal in blocks. And now comes the part um, where com communication is required. Each, par, uh, each process sends its data chunk to the next one, to its next partner, um, and then computes the corresponding distances between these pairs. So for example, um, process one um, sends its data to process two and gets uh, the chunk from process zero and can then calculate the pairwise distances between the chunk from one and the chunk from zero. Um, and by that, calculating these off diagonals. And since we know that pairwise distances for commonly used matrix is, um, are, are, are symmetrical, each process can now send its calculated chunk back to the one from which it received its data and by that say, uh, uh, setting the mirror um, diagonal of the matrix. And this we do over and over again until after um, uh, P minus one iterations, we get to the point where we only have to calculate half the part. So the first half of the processes are sending their data, the second half of the processes are receiving their data, um, calculating the, 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 the blocks of um, pairwise distances and are sending them back to their um, receiving processes. And by that, we can iteratively compute the entire distance matrix. Now, immediately you see the problem with this. Um, this scales with the number of processes that are used which is not op optim uh, optimal, obviously. Um, the more processes I use, the more iterations I have to do. The upside of this is that we can actually do accurate calculations of pairwise distances for the entire matrix. Whereas other algorithms, if you go, for example, to DASK, they have to rely on some approximations um, for uh, to, in order to um, only approximate this matrix and then further on compute. However, if you are in a situation where you need these, uh, these calculations, for example, because you want to do a fully connected graph, there is no way around it. And we have the situation that with pairwise distance calculations, it's not only a question of speed. So using more processes is not necessary just to be faster, but to actually do this, because you can imagine that 30,000 by 30,000 floating point values um, if you go to higher number of samples, you easily explode your local memory of one machine, and therefore you have to go into a distributed setting. Um, and the, the, the resulting um, similarity matrix is then also distributed across, um, across the, the uh, one of its axes. Okay, um, but as Claudia already showed, um, some weak and strong scaling experiments showed that we do not have optimal scaling. Um, however, we are still faster than DASK. Um, and with some tweaks, in this case, this is um, Euclidean distance, we actually managed to beat um, the PyTorch original um, implementations on single node processes. Um, okay, so onwards back to our rocket science. Um, the, what we did was then take the heat, k-means, and spectral clustering um, algorithms on our time-resolved image data in order to cluster the different time frames. Um, and we did this rather easily. Rolling out an image um, into a one-dimensional vector gives you basically your features, and then every time frame uh, represents a sample. Uh, so we have 30,000 samples and roughly 200,000 features. Um, the experiments that I did were run on the DLR um, institutional computer cluster um, on three nodes, uh, which each 150 CPU processes. Uh, now, obviously, going for GPU would have been much faster. However, this machine did not have as many. Um, and these were uh, very uh, popular to be used. So computation trying to get is rather difficult. 
Okay, um, first of all, from the theory um, of the combustion dynamics, um, three phases of, uh, can be expected. The first part would be the ignition of, of the flame, so when the, the, the fuel actually starts burning. Then there is the part, the long part of steady state combustion, and there is a short extinction phase. So the first step is rather simply go ahead, take a means clustering for, with three clusters and cluster your data. This is something that you could uh, simply do with, uh, with scikit-learn just as well. Um, but this is also kind of a sanity test for our clustering. In terms of experimental evaluation, we see that whilst K-means does find three clusters um, and can distinctively separate the ignition phase, um, the extinction phase is so short and small that it is um, assigned to clusters one and two here. And this is one of the problems that K-means has, that it is looking always for um, similar size clusters. So um, clusters with very few samples are likely to be neglected. So um, with some previous work from colleagues at um, DLR, um, the number of seven um, clusters was identified to be actually optimal. Um, if, if you're familiar with K-means, this was determined by a, an elbow plot. Um, and with um, the seven flow phases, um, the, for two out of four experiments, the, um, the, the extinction phase can actually be separated rather well. Um, the more important or more interesting question here is, I'm pretty sure the computation time, depending on the, the experiment and thus depending on the number of iterations that came in how to run, this computation took between 5 and 26 minutes. Um, just for comparison, on, um, on scikit, these experiments took roughly about an hour. Um, so as I said previously, the whole goal of this was also to find like short-term turbulences and anomalies in the data. Um, and we can see here that the, the algorithm OK means already has problems with this. However, it can manage to. A very simple approach to this is just tune up, just crank up your number of K. And with heat, you can actually now do this because even though you suffer curves of dimensionality, even though your computation time scales with the number of, uh, of, of clusters you're looking for, uh, with heat, this is all feasible. So what we did, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot about this. This is just um, exemplary images of these seven flow phases um, that can actually be um, aligned or, or, or um, identified to be to have physical properties of the combustion. Now, the idea was to go and find outliers, and by that, just set k to a high value. In this case, we chose 20. Um, obviously, there will be overlapping clusters, so um, the algorithm making two clusters out of data points where there is one, but uh, chances are that it also finds very small. And in this case, we see that um, for the highest classes, it actually is able to now for every uh, experiment to identify um, the, these extinction clusters. However, the, the overall cluster distribution, as you can see in these plots where the, the cluster ID uh, is plotted over time, is rather smooth. So we don't see any outliers or turbulences or anything, or no small clusters that are distinctly different than from the others. Um, in terms of compu uh, compute time, we are here roughly in the area of 40 to um, 80 minutes, uh, which is quite some time by now. Um, as I said, with GPU, this is uh, likely to be way faster. Okay, this is K-means. Um, in terms of scalability, K-means uh, in heat scales really, really nicely, as can be seen here in our weak scaling and strong scaling plots um, compared to a baseline implementation in NumPy, which is basically the second learn, learn implementation, um, and a baseline implementation similarly done um, in PyTorch and compared to, to Dask again. Um, okay, so this was K-means. Um, for spectral clustering, um, there, there is the advantage that um, the process of clustering can be distributed or separated into two 
parts, so to say. The first one is what I talked about, the calculation of pairwise distances, and by that setting up the similarity matrix. And actually just having a visual qualitative look at these similarity matrices um, gives you an estimate about your data set. Um, in this case, um, I used a Gaussian kernel um, to, to compute pairwise pair similarity between all data sets. Um, and for four different experiments, um, the results of these matrices are shown here. Um, so in, uh, on, on, on X and Y, you just see um, the, the, the time step um, and then the similarity plotted in color. And we see that in some of these um, experiments, there's these stripe-like structures. There is blocks that are more distinctive. Um, and these are already good indicators for different phases and also irregularities. As for example, in the um, right-hand side upper test, at about 2.1, uh, 2.2 seconds, there in this yellow block, there is a very distinct greenish bar. So that means that in this phase, for a very, very short time, um, the, the, the combustion images look very different to those um, before. Um, distance calculation in this part took um, roughly about an hour um, for all, uh, independently of the number of cases. Um, and then having a closer look at actually these very small bands that we can see in the structure for some examples, we can have a look at the images and see that there are actually differences. For example, um, the, the band that I mentioned before is now on the uh, lower left. And there are these uh, droplets and, and spray um, little dots that you can see um, indicating that uh, there are some turbulences happening. Um, you can then further go on and do the eigenvalue um, decomposition in the case of the um, of, of heat spectral clustering algorithm. This is done using a Lanchus um, algorithm um, where you can just run a number of a few iterations smaller than the matrix dimensions to get the lowest eigenvalues. And then cluster these eigenvalues and you can now see that despite the fact that we took the same number of clusters as before with k-means, we get completely different results. And especially in the two cases on the left-hand side, there are small distinct clusters uh, in between phase transitions of the flame that are indicators for irregularities in the combustion. In terms of um, scalability, um, spectral clustering suffers the worse scaling of the distance calculations. However, with the eigenvalue decomposition via the Nutshell algorithm, scaling is not as bad. Um, and it definitely outperforms DASK um, in this. And it needs to be said that um, DASK for its spectral clustering algorithm uses an approximation of the Laplacian matrix. Um, and if you are really interested in, um, in, in precise results in actual floating point numbers, um, then you might consider um, taking actually the heat algorithm, um, even though its scalability might be a bit worse. And with this, I am done with my contribution. Um, I see there are questions popping up. Um, I don't know how you maybe want to um, uh, moderate them, Morris, Claudia. Um, well, thank you very much. Firstly, I think it was a very nice talk. I particularly liked also always these examples, uh, comparing it with PyTorch and the other runtimes. Um, we have not so much time for questions, but I think in the light um, of doing a bit more minutes, we can have certainly a couple of uh, questions tackled. So um, anyone wants to raise a question right now, please go ahead. I think many of the questions actually that have been raised, you already answered, Charlotte, as I see. <laughs> Very good. Anyone else with the question for Claudia or for Charlotte? Okay, it doesn't I think everyone seem... wants to go to lunch. <laughs> yeah, seems like, seems like. Yeah, it's just a short question, maybe um, thinking about half is over. And the developer community now so how how is it financed how are the developer teams working on it i know sustainability is always a tricky question after those projects 
but let's say how how you organize yourself the community the support is the national competence center of germany helping somehow from your cc um what what are there the plans or ideas so at the moment um i think the um Helmholtz ai is uh, very much involved in this in fact i was looking at the at the KIT Helmholtz AI webpage, and basically the heat core developers have taken over. <laughs> Charlie, is that right? <laughs> yes, I think we somehow merged that, um, <laughs> that, that Marcus got Daniel and me to KIT. Yes. Um, I think, like from KIT side, definitely Helmholtz AI is a way that we will continue working on heat, um, just because uh, a lot of our topics are AI and scalability. Um, so we are heading towards just making use of it, distributing it more. Um, I'm not sure how Judith is um, doing this. And I think in terms of what the future brings um, with the new collaboration with Intel, um, we uh, are definitely on a rise and have more opportunities um, to go on. I mean, yeah, we don't have direct financing by a half anymore. However, um, HEAT is now in its stage already part of several other um, funding grants that we have. Um, one was a health AI um, call for profile that we're doing together with PLR. Um, and I'm pretty sure at Ulich there are also several ones and this is how it will live on. Okay, um, I would say Stefan Kesselheim from Helmholtz AI in Ulich is certainly open for discussion. So maybe there's a good way of, uh, you know, joining forces together in this so i guess it's uh, yes, i guess yeah, probably something already, that should be done yeah yeah stefan has already approached us there is uh, discussions ongoing and um, however i would have to forward this question to marcus as he's handling this <laughs> yeah no it's very good yeah. uh, particularly in the light of the fact that uh, good to hear that marcus has a career there he was a student at the university of iceland once my phd student so i'm very glad to see him there striving I think, is there any other urgent question? Otherwise I would start closing this. And I guess um, the team around HEAT is there. We have heard um, there are even tutorials to get the first steps done. So I guess there's lots of material that we could look at. So, so I guess my question then uh, to mm -hmm. you guys, or everybody who listened would be, um, are you going to get in touch with us? <laughs> or uh, uh, maybe it should have been a poll, but uh, would you be interested, for example, in attending a, a heat um, hackathon later this year, for example, with uh, with own use cases or uh, you know just without? I, th I think that could be a good idea. Yes, mm -hmm. I think we should prepare it a bit because as I said, right. some of the use cases have extreme data right, talking about terabytes or so mm -hmm. from CFD simulations, where it's not so easy to, to just put it on a USB stick and p come by. But I think, yes, we should definitely keep talking about it. And I would suggest maybe after summer, we should, you know, have a more regular interaction. And then by then, we also know a bit more clearly what all the different use cases are doing in this interaction room process, what kind of modeling they need, where heat maybe could have overlaps or where we even maybe contribute to heat mm -hmm. before we start yet another toolkit, which would have been my next question about this critic. But I guess in light of the time, we have to think about closing the workshop. Other people have to go to lunch. Okay. But, okay, thank you very much, Claudia. And also <laughs> thank you very much, Charlotte. I'm sure we see us again. Yeah, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you, it was a pleasure. Right. I just want to basically close this um, again for everyone else. Also, thanks for joining. And as you know, from the previous um, uh, kind of talks and seminars we had, there's much more information on our race website. So please go there. There's also information about the use cases. Today, you got us insights about heat, what could be, let's say, part of our unique AI framework. Of course, alongside maybe other tools that we will see here. Interesting for us was today that heat was always compared to Horowat and guess what will be the next seminar in July? Horowat. But before that, just remember that basically um, the YouTube channel is there also. And this video of today from heat will be also available on the YouTube channel. Uh, probably not directly this week. We usually do some effort here of uh, post-processing, 
but it will be also there um, available on the YouTube channel as all the other seminars we had since then. And just a short appetizer in July. So what would be the next seminar? Probably at the end of July. Um, I think this falls, falls very nicely together because in heat was always compared to some of the Horobot runs. I found this particularly nice. And also Horobot is really used a lot at the Uli Supercomputing Center, also at the University of Iceland. So we will share some insights why this data parallel framework is quite good. I don't say it's necessarily a competitor always for heat. So it has some, um, let's say, positive and negative aspects. But here we will talk a little bit how it works and essentially that it can be used together with TensorFlow, with PyTorch, essentially on top of it. We will have some examples and uh, also some challenges reviewed. Uh, for instance, what we mostly in our application use cases have is the challenge of this of the batch size, you know, you see here a little bit, the more batch sizes, the bigger they are, you have a significant drop in performance. And basically, although the training size goes up because there's less interaction, um, you of course come to the trouble that the performance is not good enough, uh, that the accuracy is not good enough. However, it is good um, for some certain batch sizes that we see a good trade-off. And it is possible, as you see here as an example in one of our papers, really to use a big deep learning network and scale it up and basically have it on 96 or 100. I think the last results were on 128 GPUs even. So it is possible to use Horobot. And there, of course, it would be an interesting contribution to our unique AI framework in one point or another. And yeah, the Basically, join us there in July if you have interest. Um, the concrete date and time will be, of course, announced. And we will then look a little bit more how it exactly runs. Um, what basically could you do in terms of maybe see you erase AI modeling in it and how you combine it with job scripts on your HPC scripts to get it easily introduced. And that's all I wanted to leave on the table here for you with the seminar. Once again, sorry for going a bit over time, but thank you very much and talk to you.